Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a good morning. It's an, my, it's an honor for me to join you all today. I'd like to thank uh, my friend and my host, Mr. Thani Azuri, for inviting me and congratulate him and his team for arranging an important and beneficial conference. I also like to congratulate Dr. Thani for receiving the Government Excellence Award yesterday for the Ministry of uh, Climate Change and Environment. Congratulations, Dr. Sun. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 2018 was an active, productive year for Singapore on the climate front. We launched the Singapore Year of Climate Action to raise awareness and encourage ground-up initiatives, action to address climate change. More than 800 activities were conducted with our partners from civil society, corporate sector, as well as the community, amounting to two activities for every day of 2018. At the same time, we also got 340,000 pledges for climate action from the public. On the regulatory front, we implemented our carbon tax, the first in Southeast Asia, after adopting the Energy Conservation Act which will regulate large consumers of energy in the industry particularly. We also push for greater adoption of solar energy and continue to, advise, continue to invest in water supply and drainage infrastructure to increase Singapore's climate resilience. At the regional and international fronts, we convened the Special ASEAN Ministerial Conference on Climate Action or SAPCA and also extended SAPCA to involve other partners from China, Korea, as well as Japan. This is important because for climate action, we need to galvanize regional and global action. At the meeting, Singapore launched a climate action package to help build capacity. I delivered Singapore's first voluntary national review at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal to reaffirm our commitment to sustainable development. We concluded the year of climate action by playing a key negotiation role at the UN Climate Conference in Poland in December, which adopted the Katowice package. And this includes rules for implementing the Paris Agreement. With the rules in place, I hope all countries will accelerate efforts to implement our commitments, the rest in the Paris Agreement, and Singapore will, of course, do its part. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that with climate change, there will be rising temperatures. And in our tropical urban environment, this will lead to a higher incidence of vector-borne diseases, notably dengue, which accounts for 20,000 global deaths every year. Combating dengue raises unique challenge for Singapore. First, that for Singapore, the dengue mosquito Aedes aegypti, the main vector of dengue, is not indigenous to our region. And it has actually adapted very well to its environment. If you want to look for dengue breeding, you just have to know where people live and they are just around them. They don't like to fly very far. Second, Therefore, breeding occurs largely indoors, in densely populated and high-rise dwelling, which means that fogging generally doesn't work. And third, there are large visitor movements in and out of the country, which increase the risk of spreading dengue across borders. To stem this threat, we turn to technology and innovation to prevent more severe consequences of dengue as a result of climate change. The Environment Health Institute of the National Environment Agency has been studying the use of male Aedes aegypti mosquito carrying the Wolbachia bacteria, a natural bacteria, which will reduce the dengue mosquito population and lower dengue transmission. How does this work? When a male Wolbachia Aedes mosquito mates with an urban Aedes aegypti female mosquito that does not carry Wolbachia, the resultant eggs will not hatch. It's as simple as that. However, releasing the male Wolbachia Aedes mosquito presents its own challenges. 
We know that it could potentially suppress the dengue mosquito population in the community. In other words, we reduce the mosquito population by adding mosquitoes, which is a paradox. The results have been promising with 50% in this population uh, reduction. The mosquito eggs were shown to be non-viable in the first trial that we conducted recently. I believe we are leading in this area to understand the behavior of released mosquito in an urban setting. It has, among other things, highlighted the challenges of ensuring uniform distribution of these Wolbachia aedes mosquitoes in our high-rise landscape. We have discovered, for example, that they don't, don't like to fly high. So if you release it at the ground floor, you'll find that they don't fly to the 10th floor or the 15th floor. You actually have to release them up there. And this has spurred further innovation with local and international companies by working with a local startup company called Orino Technology. Other inventions include simple yet sophisticated counters that accurately count mosquitoes for efficient and quality production of these mosquitoes. Five intellectually intellectual property patents have been filed from these creative solutions. As these nascent technologies matures, we hope innovation and technological solutions will contribute positively to research and economic activity while improving public health in Singapore and in similarly dense urban cities around the world. Let me now touch on water. Water is another example where innovation and technology were critical to enhancing our resilience and preparing for climate change. Because it's an existence, existential issue for us, Singapore has early on shifted away from viewing water as, single, as a single-use resource. Over the last three decades, we have developed a circular water ecosystem, which focuses on conserving and reusing water over and over again. This was achieved painstakingly by investing in infrastructure that recovers and recycles every single drop. Pricing water in accordance to its long-term scarcity and leveraging on technology. The result is as follows. After 10 years of investing in R&D, we have created 14,000 jobs across more than 200 companies in 25 R&D centres. The sector was further boosted in 2016 with an injection of 200 million Singapore dollars for R&D for the National Research Foundation under the Research Innovation and Enterprise IRE 2020 plan. This brings a total funding of $670 million for the next 15 years and contribute $2.85 billion annually to the economy by 2020 and create more companies like Ecosoft, which received the Zayed Sustainability, Sustainability Water Prize on Monday for innovating to increase sustainability in Singapore and beyond. Today, recycled water in Singapore, known as New Water, and desalination provide us with new sources of water that is more climate resilient. As a result of these efforts, our water sector closely reflects a circular economy. Water and Wolbachia technologies are just two areas where innovation has been bearing fruit to overcome urban challenge and climate change. Having seen the value that a circular economy can contribute, we are keen to extend this approach to other sectors. We are acutely aware that population growth, industrialization, and the rise of consumerism have led to unrestrained exploitation of global resources. Yet, we remain fixated with the take, make, use, and toss philosophy, and ignore the fact that resources are actually finite as is the earth capacity to absorb pollution and wastes. As such, we designated 2019 as Singapore's year towards zero waste last Saturday. The aim is to imbue in our citizens a greater consciousness on the need to treasure our precious resources and to do our part to protect the planet. Our strategy for zero waste 
institutes to adopt the circular economy, principles that will support future economic growth without compromising on our environmental goals. It will require a paradigm shift from our usual take, make, use and toss philosophy to one where we treasure every resource and aim to reuse and recycle them endlessly, just like we did for water. Retain the resources within and not keep taking them from Mother Nature. This will require us to go beyond the traditional three R's, which all know, reduce, reuse, and recycle, and embrace broader re-X approaches, such as repurposing, remanufacturing, redesigning, repairing, and even rethinking business processes. We can derive maximum value from resources by extending their life through recovery and regeneration. The circular economy will, of course, create new value, new jobs, and opportunities. Imagine our cities becoming urban mines, where raw materials we need is right here under our noses, and we recover treasure from trash. Singapore will publish our Zero Waste Master Plan later this year. Our efforts will center on three key waste streams, namely electronic waste, plastic and packaging, and also food waste. We will increase Singapore's R&D funding to transform the environmental services industry. For instance, we require producers to recycle and dispose of electronic waste responsibly by implementing the extended producer responsibility framework by 2021. We will also implement a mandatory reporting framework of our packaging data and waste reduction plans from 2020 onwards. But thereafter, consider adopting the same EPR framework for plastics and packaging waste. However, we know the government cannot do it alone. To deal with the challenges ahead, we need a whole-of-nation approach. We need all stakeholders, notably the private sector and civil society, to come together, pull our efforts, and work together for the common good. For example, we have launched the hashtag RecycleRights movement to ensure proper recycling in order to keep recyclable waste clean, dry, and free of food waste. We're also working close with other governments. Yesterday, Mr. Stani Azioni and I launched a workshop on zero waste that is jointly organized by the Singapore and UAE as part of the ADSW. Conferences such as these are useful as they allow us to share best practices and provide opportunities for cooperation and partnership between countries and across regions. Indeed, next week, Singapore will host the third forum of ministers and environment authorities for Asia-Pacific. 41 countries from Asia-Pacific will share their views on innovation solutions for environmental challenges and sustainable consumption and production. The outcome of the meeting will be compared to the 4th UN Environmental Assembly to be held in March in Nairobi. Later this year, Singapore will also participate in the Climate Summit especially convened by the UN Secretary General. I'm confident that this platform will further work global progress on sustainable development as will be the meetings held right here in Abu Dhabi. Let me conclude. Singapore is a small, resource-poor island. Like the UAE's founding father, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nanyan, Singapore's first Prime Minister, Mr Lee Kuan Yew, also recognised from the outset the need to balance economic growth with the conservation of our precious resources. We have looked at technology and cooperation to enable us to do more with less, help us overcome constraints and develop innovative solutions to deal with environmental challenges. We will continue to attach a high priority to sustainable developments and take active steps to safeguard critical natural resources so that economic growth leads to good social and environmental outcomes. On this note, let me thank again Mr. Sani Zayudi once again for inviting me to the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. Thank you.